really put my two weeks in and left Nike. And I was telling people what I was doing on an as need to know basis because I really didn't have it figured out. Well, after all that stuff is done, what's the value of all your real estate going to be? Probably about three million. Everybody. <laughs> and it was just popped up in a photo with Barack Obama. Like, right. everybody's like that. They get right. somewhere. That's right. just the reality of it. And if that makes somebody feel some type of way, well, f you too. And I was like, wow, black people work at Nike. This is crazy. Yeah. Oh, so what's up? What are we talking about today, man? Man. I feel like this is like a big deal. Why, do, why am I always, why do I always start everybody's podcast? Start it? Yeah. I, started, like, I, was, I was the first person on another one of the homies' podcasts. How do we do this? I got to figure it out. I don't know. Does it look? Is it good? Yeah. Okay, you can see you. Yeah, man. What's up, man? You know what I'm saying? Okay. It's, your boy, it's your boy Molly Ball, man. I'm, just, I'm in the house, man. I'm looking here. I'm looking at me, man. I ain't looking at you. I ain't worried about you, dog. <laughs> you were the root of everybody's podcast. Not really. <laughs> I just thought about I was on two podcasts for the first time. Okay. So I'm laughing. And it was their first time. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And well, they, they actually got way cooler as time went along. And then we'll, we'll bring you back. Yeah. You know, how I it never goes. got brought back to their podcast. Oh, but you know, I'm bringing you back. I'm back. <laughs> we shot one before, <laughs> and then it was a fail on your end. Yeah, yeah. So he didn't approve the first podcast, but he dropped it anyways. But we're back. No, he didn't. Oh, you didn't? No, nah, oh, I never I dropped I saw it. it. Oh. No, nah, no, nah, I didn't drop it. So now we're back, and you got a book out. Yes, yeah, done. You're doing more things. Always. You got stuff with the business. Living better. And it's perfect because I like on this channel, we're doing this on the main channel, DNA show. Okay. <laughs> we're legit. I like that. I'm we're on the DNA show okay. now. Okay. About time. So we got okay. big eyes over here. But I want to talk about Nike stuff. I want to talk about sneaker stuff too, because this is a sneaker channel. Okay. But because you know you got some history. I do. I worked to Nike and football. And, and I think that kind of affects how you wrote your book too. It does. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself how you would like to, and then we're just going to start rapping because I know we got a lot to talk about. We got a lot to talk about. We got time, baby. <laughs> My name is Henry Oregon. I'm the founder and CEO of Disruptive Sports Agency. Uh, we represent NFL athletes, NFL coaches, basketball coaches, strength coaches, and NBA players. I also subsequently wrote a book called The Informational Interview, uh, How to Master the Informational Interview, and it has another long abbreviation that we finalized. The book was inspired by my journey into Nike mm -hmm. and how I got my first job there okay. and then how I continue to propel that information and the informational interview to connecting with other people along my journey and my different careers that I've had and okay, the different dope. things that I've done. So I know we're going to touch on the book throughout, but I'm interested to see the start uh, before Nike. What made you even want to be at Nike? Because I know for me, I live here. I'm in Portland, Oregon, yeah. you know. Yeah. But for you, like, what made you want to be you know a what? part of that's Nike? A, that's a great question. I think that it goes back to when I was like 10. Okay. And my uncle gave us a fake, t me and my me and my uh, cousins, a fake $10,000. Yeah. And we were supposed to invest in stocks. We were supposed okay. to buy whatever stocks were with $10,000. Here are the prices. And I was the person out of my cousins that I wasn't say I wasn't the most I wasn't the smartest book smart guy. Okay, right? They all went to like Stanford, Harvard, Princeton. Because you're in the Bay. To, yeah, and I went to Portland State. So <laughs> <laughs> they're all super like mad geniuses. Right. And I picked I would invest in Nike mm -hmm. Water, and I think the third one was Berkshire Hathaway, just because. In our family, my uncle, my grandfather actually saved Warren Buffett's life. Mm -hmm. And so those are three stocks I picked. Oh, and I picked Apple. Okay. And so I won by like a long shot by the time we were adults and looking at what those stocks were, what those mm -hmm. values were on those stocks. So my love for Nike just kind of stemmed from there. I was... I was not, I would never say I was a humongous sneakerhead. I think I was for a hot second, maybe two years. I was getting every pair of J's yeah. that came out right after the Air Force Ones dropped. So yep. like, like that was like my thing. Yep. And then I stopped getting all the shoes, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm not feeling this right now. I'm, right. Not, I'm, I'm tired of waiting in line. It's and a not lot of work. Shoes. It's a yeah. lot of work when it comes to collecting shoes for sure. And then when I went, when I was picking schools to go to college, my buddy Mario Brown, who went to Eastern Washington. He first got his first offer from Portland State. He's okay. going to Portland State. And so, long story short, short story long, he introduced me to the coaching staff, and I walked on to Portland State. And I wanted to go to Portland State or Oregon because I knew that 
that's where Nike was. Right. Never been to Nike headquarters campus. Didn't know the story. Didn't really know nothing so about it. So you had it. never even been to like but Portland or Oregon Nike before. Nike was there and I was like, I'm going to work there. Sheesh. And then our first time at, my first time at Nike campus was at Portland State. We had practiced there on the Bo Jackson field. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, black people work at Nike. This is crazy. Yeah. Like, wow, this is tight. This is like an extension of college. I want, I'm going to work here. Right. My, my, I was never, uh, a guy that was, I want to, this is what I'm going to do. Right. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. Right. That's funny. I talk about that too. Like, we don't talk about goals. We no. talk about outcomes. Yep. How are we going to get the outcome that we want? Yep. It's not a goal. It's, mm-hmm. What are we going to do to get to what we want? Yeah. And oftentimes that can be miscued as cocky or arrogant, but fuck it. Like, right. everybody's like that to get right. somewhere. That's right. just the reality of it. And if that makes somebody feel some type of way, well, fuck you too. Right. So. No, I feel that. And then you put in your room, you know, you and me, we vibe together because we're on that same vibe. Like, yeah. <laughs> we got to get to where we need to be. Yeah. And we're trying to figure it out. It's not trying to belittle others. It's just like, this is my mindset. And like minded individuals somehow come into your life. Right. Right. For sure. No, it's it makes sense. Works. Definitely. So you're young. This you're 18 years old at the time. You're going to Nike campus freshman year. No, it's uh, junior year. So I was junior. like 20, 21. Oh, okay. So you're a little bit older. Yeah. Okay. And we're, we're hitting, you know, it's a live practice. Like yeah. all the Nike execs that are in football are there <laughs> and we get to talk to them afterwards. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. So yeah. I was, I was also a, a cleat tester so oh, I was yeah, trying yeah. out cleats and, and wearing them and giving feedback so some like the vapor ones I was trying those out like years before they came out right that's what we used to do at my high school mm-hmm. out here so that's yeah so I remember I, those days I felt super special like, no for oh, real yeah. I got the all black cleats like no nah, you can't take no pictures of these don't take my <laughs> right. it's like it's not that serious yeah. nobody's gonna know what they are anyways right. Right. so I think that um, that was really dope and then when I stopped playing football the guy that gave us the uh, cleats to test it was named mm-hmm. was Dan Fratz and he was a Portland State alumni he was actually a kicker he wasn't even like nothing crazy cool right. but he was super swaggy and super dope and so I asked to meet with him when I finished playing he's like yeah no problem shoot me an email mm-hmm. and I was like what does that even mean like, right. shoot me an email right. so of course like most kids do still now I sent like a novel <laughs> literally five pages he's like he responded back didn't read none of that when do you want to meet Right. I was like, you got time this week? And he's like, okay, cool. <laughs> this is where we're meeting. Then he knew I didn't know what I was talking about. Right. And so he coached me up. He kind of gave me up like how to like conduct yourself, how to mm-hmm. talk to people. And then he connected me with somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, he connected with, luckily with somebody that looked like me, mm-hmm. whose name was Katie. And then Katie connected me with Ian Williams. Okay. And Ian Williams is now like famous on the <laughs> Nike sneaker app. I don't even know what he does. I just see his face on the sneaker app. I'm like, wow, okay, you famous now. Connections. Yeah. yeah. And he can, Ian Williams is like kind of like the godfather out here in Portland, I feel like, of like the underground sneaker culture. And he worked at Nike as well. Yeah, he worked at Nike as well. And his story is in the book. Dope. And Ian taught me what an informational interview was, how to conduct it. Okay. He taught me a lot of like my ticks and tricks. And then I added on to that and so Ian always calls me informational hen I wrote a book about it (laughs) that's funny okay so you go to Nike Mm -hmm. and now you're like I'm interviewing these people I'm interested in this stuff now how do you get the job man it's tough well first you have to figure out like what do you want to do you can't just say I want to work at Nike everybody says that right there's a thousand different jobs at Nike so many sales marketing product creation engineering, uh, human resources, social media, brand marketing, sports marketing. Like, so I'm learning about all this stuff and I'm figuring out what I not don't want to do. Mm-hmm. I did not want to do merchandise. I did not want to, because they worked really hard. I did not want to work anymore at Nike Retail because that was my, one of my first jobs out of college. I worked Nike Retail along with like five other jobs just to get my foot in the door and okay. learn about the brand. But did leveraging, did you leverage your work at retail for getting oh my your job? God, did I? Okay. So that got that's, me that's the black A lot badge. of people wonder about that. Yes. Go ahead. So I, I got lucky enough. At first I was failing and failing and failing applying to, you know, Nike Portland, uh, Nike MLK. Mm-hmm. Even though I knew those guys, they didn't hire me. Really? Yeah, they didn't hire me. None of them. They actually shitted on me. <laughs> didn't resume in the trash. I came in there like, I can work here. Have a resume. They're like, yeah. <laughs> Do it like, do it's it out. It's so interesting. 
I mean, I'm not trying to, again, talk mm-hmm. down or anything, mm-hmm. but it's so interesting how people that work at the outlets and at the retail spots, they hold it even higher, like, gatekeeping mm-hmm. standard mm-hmm. to the stuff. I think it's crazy. It's more like crazy inter- how it comes full circle. Yeah. Because then when you, when you get to where they want to be at, then they want to kiss your ass. Yeah. You know? And so, me, I'm not like that. I don't hold grudges. But there's only so far I'm going to help you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That's just the reality of it. Right. Because of how you treated me in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Now I've surpassed you in a sense, right? Just status level to or where job, you would like to be. It is, right. great. Yeah. And then they want to come and, you know, how did you get there? Can you help? Like, not can you help me? Help me. Right. You know, like, it should be crazy. But yeah. we'll talk about that in the book too. But definitely getting the black badge and working Nike retail. It taught me the products, mm-hmm. it taught me the brand, and it gave me access to Nike's gyms and intramurals. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's where the real networking goes on. Okay. Like organic, not like fake, like we're just all, I just happened to get on the best football flag football team. <laughs> you right, know what I mean? Right. And those were a lot of like the good executives um, that worked in Nike football, that worked on that team, that mm-hmm. were on that team. And I was around long enough, and the one guy's name was Andy Miguel. He's in the book too. He was on my team for two and a half years. Okay. And he's like, yeah, shoot me an email. He didn't respond ever. Like <laughs> He responded like maybe twice, right? right? And then when I graduated college, finally, right, he sends me an email like literally on graduate. He responds finally. I never gave up. Uh-huh. I emailed him every single week. Okay. And then as time went on, I'd see him. And, you know, I'd make good plays. So I thought on the right. flag team, or like, whatever, which is cool, or had good conversations with people, I would hit him up twice a week, three <laughs> times a week, four times a week. And I know he'd see me because right. I hit him at all different hours of the right, day. Right. Sometimes I'd, you know, uh, before it was, uh, I was so crazy, before you could program when to send an email, right. I would wake up at 5 a.m. to send the email and then go back to bed. <laughs> hey, I'm up. Right. What's up? Right. Like, you know? And he'd be like, really, I'm back to sleep. Like, if you replied, <laughs> you might not catch me for a couple hours. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> but he hits me up. The day, like, like the week after my graduation, mm-hmm. at like five a.m., four a.m., some like crazy hour, and I was I was partying. He's like, "Yo, today's partner is ShopDNAShow.com. Are you tired of wearing low quality gear? I completely understand. I made a personal mission to go out and find higher quality stuff and give it to you guys at an affordable price. And not only because of that." I have to wear this stuff every day and I don't want to be wearing cheap clothing all the time. So I want to make sure that you guys know about it and are understanding that we have a lot of cool stuff coming out as well. Hit the link down below or pinned or wherever it may be. It's going to be shopdnashow.com. There's new drops every single month. I'm excited to see you guys in the gear. And now let's go ahead and get back to the podcast. Come in. I want you to interview for this position or whatever it was. So after my 100 informational interviews, I was prepared, right? I had had my resume done. It was creative. I had different pitches. I had different examples of right. the, the grind and the grit. And his only question was, hey, Henry, you know, I, know you, I know you've been emailing forever. You've been persistent in your emails. You know, subject line said persistency. Mm-hmm. Well, here's your shot. Yep. Why should I hire you to be the Nike football brand marketing coordinator or specialist, whatever the job was? It was Nike football. I think it was coordinator. And I was like, He's like, what? It's like, tell me about a time in your life when you failed mm-hmm. and why you're still here. And I forget the story that I told him, but it was basically like, just literally, did I ever give up on emailing you? That's how I treat everybody. Right. So if you hire me, that's the level of what you're going to get. Right. And that's what he needed. He needed somebody that was a, a hound dog or somebody that just was like, going to keep sicking right. at projects right. because. A lot of the stuff we do in marketing is like so many different parts have to come together. Mm-hmm. You got to get product that isn't out yet. You got to, you know, connect with the photo shoot team. You got to talk to retail about what they're actually releasing and where they're releasing it. And like, you had to stay on people to get their jobs done so you could get your job done. And that's what he needed at the time. So answering the question what I did got me the job. And then I got the job. And then not only when I got the job, I had to figure out how to get my own computer and get my own self signed up for the job. <laughs> like, <laughs> figure out how to contact HR. Figure out how to get yourself a computer. Figure out how to get yourself paid. Right. I was like, this is crazy. Right. Like, it was like nothing I'd ever experienced, but it taught me how to be self sufficient. Right. And to figure it out. Right. Right. I like that. Okay. So, like I said, you you we want to talk about Nike and sneaker because especially 
I heard you say black badge. Yes. Right? Yes. So tell the people what the black badge is, because a lot of people don't even know what a black badge is. Honestly, I don't even know what a black badge means anymore. I just know it used that to, okay, what it's it used a full-time to mean back in the employee. Day. It's a full-time employee, mm-hmm. and you you are a Nike employee. A lot of people that work at Nike are ETWs. They're contracted workers. Even at even at headquarters and outlets. Yeah, and even stuff. at retail outlets and headquarters. Yep. So they're part-time workers. They don't have Nike benefits. They don't have a Nike swoosh account mm-hmm. or elite account. They don't have those things that make you elite, right? Mm-hmm. That allow you to get the supreme discounts. They don't have the access to the training facilities at Nike campus or the restaurants. They can't just go up there. But when you have a black yeah. badge, you can because you're an employee. And there's, yeah, so that's what people don't understand. There's literally levels in Nike. Mm-hmm. Not only like CEO and all that yep. stuff, but like there's a lot of different those brackets. Yeah, and they have like, you know, they have a, what's called the band levels. Mm-hmm. I forget what they are, but there's like L band, which is like entry level, A band or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it, you go through the band levels and that's basically dictates what your pay is. Right. And so you can know what type of what type of level somebody's on based on their band level. Right. right. Too, as well. You're so like, once oh. you get the black bands, then there's another level too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's where, yeah, that's where you got more, oppor- more opportunities out of that. So, okay. So you're at Nike now. You're mm-hmm. established. And you're like... I can go bigger. I'm at Nike now. And when I first got there, it's literally like the matrix. Like there's so much different stuff going on. You don't know who controls what. Mm -hmm. Then you figure out who the architects are of the whole thing. Like who's really calling the shots. Right. And then there's still elements of like things you just don't know. Like how does this product get from here to there? Where is it housed? Right. You don't know. And for me, when I was there, I was in charge of kicking out product for our brand activations. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn uh, the system, SAP, I think it was, how to ship out product. And Mm -hmm. it's all just codes, right? So like I know that I think white is... One zero zero, like the color wave in a shoe. It goes like, oh, yeah, yeah, like the color code on the boxes. And 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 so like I'm a very number oriented guy. I started to read numbers and I could see where stuff was going and what the product was Mm -hmm. without actually, I could see the picture in my head by seeing the numbers. Right. Anyways, I just think that's an interesting thing as far as there's so much stuff. It literally is the matrix. So when I was at Nike, okay, we get there, I get to the specialist level, and I'll keep it PG. I won't tell the real. Right, because this is a podcast. Oh, baby, I like it raw. I can't can't give it to you raw because I just can't, you know. You just keep it all PG. (laughs) But I'll put it like this. I knew there were, as a black man, the level I was at, there was only two more steps I could go up. Right. And I'd be stopped at that level. And so me, I don't want anything that has a ceiling. Mm-hmm. I like to be in elements or making money. There's no ceiling of what I can make. Right. So I know it's time to go. Mm-hmm. And so just like mm-hmm. I did, I didn't tell the story earlier, but just like I did when I was at Nike retail, I gave myself one year and I literally had my two weeks notice written in my email to send out two weeks before one year, my one year anniversary mm-hmm. at Nike retail. Mm-hmm. I sent it. And luckily, I got a job the week after I sent it Jeez. on campus. So just like that, I gave myself one year in this position. And if I wasn't, I think it was one and a half, one and a half years in this position. So I wanted to extend it, right? Because now I'm on campus. I'll give more time. Yeah. If I can't get a, another higher elevated job, I'm out of here. Right. Because I know I'll get stuck here at this level. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm kind of on that same thing with different stuff. Mm-hmm. 18 to 24 months. It's like, all right, if you ain't getting it by this point and seeing no progress and growth, like. You got to cut it. Say you did it, you know, glad you learned from it, mm-hmm. but you got to cut it. You can't just keep holding on to it. So just like this podcast, who knows? <laughs> we'll see 18 months from now what happens. <laughs> I mean, this podcast is going to be crazy. We're going yeah, right to have it going with up. another plaque, okay? <laughs> and hopefully, by the grace of God, I'm going to get a very small royalty check <laughs> for being the first on the DNA podcast. Hey, he pushed me on this, man. He, he's like, I'm coming to town tomorrow. <laughs> We got to shoot that video. I said, I don't got no gear. I was like, I'm going to the store right now. I'm mind ordering you, everything I need. Mind you, I thought he had everything. I didn't know you didn't have everything. Bro, that's because I just, <laughs> I've like, been busy doing other stuff. Bro, why, why you tripping? <laughs> so, okay. Well, well, how about the story for a second? Mm-hmm. How is everything going in life right now? Like mentally, <laughs> physically, everything like I want to talk about those type of things too. We have those conversations on yeah, the phone sometimes. Let's talk about it raw. Okay, Uh-oh. like he said, man, you know, I think that showing the real 
authentic stuff of what's going on. People see the glitz and the glamour, right? Mm-hmm. My dad just had a stroke. Uh, Sorry for you that. Know, he's in a rehab facility yeah. and you know, going there and, and seeing him twice, three times a week and spending extensive time with him is, is draining. And yeah. running a business, right? And then having other businesses is draining. Dropping mm-hmm. a book, it can be very draining. But I'm a dog, right. so I make that shit happen. Right, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, it. that's it. Go. That's it. That's it. <laughs> it's always gotta it go. It ain't on me. It's in me. So I don't know. I mean, I'm, I feel like every time you go through a lot of stuff like this, you only come out stronger. Yeah, you come out more appreciative. Mm-hmm. You come out more patient. Yeah, and you just get better, or you or you crash and burn and you go crazy. So no, for sure, I'm not crazy yet. Yet it's gonna take more <laughs> than that life to kick my ass down. <laughs> well. How are you kind of, I guess, navigating, you know, I don't know how you want to say coping with it or whatever you like mm-hmm. to say, but just keeping yourself sane at the same time. Because I think a lot of people don't have that answer or they don't ask that question. Like for me, I've switched my daily routine over the past mm-hmm. couple of months and different things I've been integrating into how I look at stuff. Uh, it's made me much more sharper. Like I had to schedule out things even more effective. I had to schedule out my free time now. Yeah. You know, usually yeah. I would just schedule out my work days, which is like, you know, five to six days a week. Mm-hmm. Right. But now I schedule out even like my quote unquote day off. Now, okay, I'm going to do these things for myself and then these things for my family. Right. So that way I'm still happy. Yeah. No, yeah. that's important. What though, about for you? Real. I think for me, it's kind of partially like that too, especially like with being married and everything and like mm-hmm. having that element. It's like now you're with somebody navigating all the stuff plus doing my stuff and then her stuff is blowing up right now too. So we're trying to like navigate our own thing plus spend time together and enjoy it. Like it's, it's a lot, but at the same time, we're like, okay, we're going to chill these days and then we're going to have, even when we're traveling, we're like, okay, even though we're going traveling and I'm busy for sneaker con and she's coming with me, mm-hmm. I'm like, we got X amount of hours, whether it's us going shopping mm-hmm. and kicking it or going I'm out to movies. I'm laughing because when he came to the Bay Area and they were arguing about what they were going to do for the anniversary and DJs put a football game in it. <laughs> I'm like, I know she doesn't want to go to a football game. <laughs> He's like, look, so, well, you don't have, a, you, don't, you don't know what we're going to do, so this is what we're going to do. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> we could go to a football game. <laughs> it's funny because, but same thing, like, okay, how can I align that for us to be happy with it? So it's like, okay, we go to the football game. But our homies are out there and her friends are out there too that she can hang out with and have friend time with people that she doesn't see as often. So just like when we're in the Bay, yeah. like we got to see her friend and we got to have time. So I think, again, just find a way to balance things and make sure that not only I'm the one that's happy, but yeah. everybody else is happy too. For sure. I think everything is just on the, everything is negotiation. Yeah. And both of them are great negotiators against each other. And they know how to get the other to bend, you know? And it's yeah. like, it's great to see, you know, in a married couple that's my age, yeah, you know, not just yeah. like old people. We'll be trying to talk it out and get through everything as much as possible. Oh, you guys do. Yeah. I just mean more like it was hella funny. Okay. So, so off of that. Yep. Anyways, <laughs> back to the story. So you're now, you see that you're ready to go. It's time to go. And you were doing something else. You were already running a business at the same time. Or when, did you start the business I, after? Yeah. Weren't you doing like the modeling thing? Yeah. Yeah. So, um. I had started the model agency, kind of, I think, but there really wasn't that much overlap. Mm -hmm. Once I finished, I got a bid Mm -hmm. to do a Nike, or it was a Rydell football photo shoot and video Okay. right after I finished. And I kind of had the thought of doing that, but then my friends at Empire Green, like, really, like, pushed me. Like, hey, like, you want technical direct? Can you bring all the models too, by the way? Right. And I was like, yeah, I could do that. Right. You know, what's the pay? And then we right. talked about it. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I could definitely do that. Right. But I'm like, ah, oh, I might be a little tough, you know, playing hardball. Yeah. But that was a blessing in disguise and Focus Models was born. Okay. So you started modeling. Let's talk Agency. about numbers too. Like, yeah. was it uh, something that was like, oh, I can make a lot of money off of this? How much did you make starting off? Like, I think that it was for me. For was, numbers? I was able to. First off, I was able to put my friends that were still trying to play football professionally Mm -hmm. in a position to make a lot of money Mm -hmm. while still training. Okay. And looking the part and doing. So, what's a lot of money? That sound like how much is a lot of money? A lot of money. (laughs) Some of those guys were making a thousand dollars a day. Okay. For a shoot, right? Okay. But they're only working maybe once every two three months. Okay. Based on the looks, but but that's a cool model, extra little kick right there. Yeah, as the model agent, you're making you know forty fifty percent commission on mm-hmm. those deals because you're charging the client, which is not the model actually. The client is 
the, the company or the agency that's hiring you to get the okay. models and then you're charging the model and then the model also um, typically you don't get paid that money for you know net 90 to 100 right, right. days to where you get the money and you pay the model so how I did it was I would offer guys advances I would pay guys early you know in up to close to 10 days from the shoot okay for a fee and so that was a very lucrative part of the business as well. But gotcha. it was a win-win for both parties, right? They had rent to pay. They had training costs to pay. And I could operate as a bank. So how much would you make like a month additionally once you started doing that? Oh, I mean, I made three times what I made at Nike, like 150 in the first year. Okay. Easy. And just it was just you. Mm-hmm. That's cool. So the, that means that the business brought in between somewhere between two fifty and three hundred fifty thousand okay. dollars. So it was and it's amazing. like automated right there because you just got the funnel, everything comes through. You just take. I care mean, of it, it. it was a lot more stressful than that. Only from the standpoint of like it's not consistent, and you didn't know when the next paycheck was coming. I got you. I like got the you. majority of it came off of one job. Yeah. And then you like advertising and marketing, and hitting people up to like, hey, hire our models. So you got to keep getting better. You got to keep bringing on more talent. And then, you know, talent at times get greedy because they're like, oh, well, like you made this. It's like, bro, it's in the contract. This isn't right. a hustle. Like right. this is, I don't have to hire you. I can just pick somebody else. Right. So, okay. So you turned down $250,000, dollars extra from your, you know, a business that's making that much money because you're like, I well, can we make had, more we money. We had a drought too. You know, I was a young black man running a model agency. And I learned, and this is just the truth. We're on a DNA podcast show. We can talk real here. As a young black business owner, during those times, in the early, you know, before all 2020, like, you had to kind of hide your face as a black business owner. Yeah. Otherwise, people would indirectly put you out of business. Or right. They wouldn't hire you. Or they'd say, oh, he's young. Like, why are we giving him that? Oh. And I had old people. They were black that even hated on me. They tried to hustle me or like devalue what I was doing by devaluing the market. Right. I was like, why are you doing that? Right. You're jealous because I'm doing it and you don't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah. that was something I just, I'm not used to being from the Bay Area. Honestly, I was very like right. taken back by it. Yeah, it's a little different on, you know, living in Portland. Just the Northwest in general. Yeah, the Northwest in general. <laughs> yes, correct. Uh, when it comes to that stuff. So now... You've kind of seen your ceiling. You're doing this. You're making extra money on the side. You got kind of like two jobs, things. You know, you got your own thing. You got your main job. But you're like, bro, I got to get out of this. Yeah. What pushed you over that line to be like, I'm really doing it. I'm switching up. Well, like I said, I mean, I really I really put my two weeks in and left Nike. Mm-hmm. And I was telling people what I was doing on an as-need-to-know basis because I really didn't have it figured out. I also was working for a sports agency in Seattle. Mm-hmm. It was really a law firm, and I was rebranding their sports agency practice to make it look cool to go get good clients. For them? Yeah. Okay. And then I realized doing marketing, unless you're the top players, you don't make any money. Right. In addition to the agent really calls the shots. So mm-hmm. why am I doing marketing? I'm I'm a shot caller. I'm like I'm making more money in this business over here than I am working for somebody else. So it got to a point where I was like, hey, you know, one friend looked at me like I was rich when I bought a house. And I looked at him like he was stupid. Right. Because he was in the league and he didn't own a house. Right. He's like, oh, you paid 500 grand cash thousand? I'm like, no, nah, no. bro. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> FHA loan. They're like, you know, right. 3% not conventional loan. Like, that's what it I means. Just something simple that he didn't understand. Uh-huh. Um, so that was, um, that was different for sure. So, you're now working with this company. Are you driving back and forth? Are you living up there? Where? In Seattle? I was driving back and forth. I was living down here. Living in Portland. Living in Portland. Bought the house in Portland. Bought the house in Portland. Okay. Going through family tri- tri- like trials and tribulations with my mom and her house and mm-hmm. her coming out of uh, bankruptcy, coming out of the home loan mortgage crisis. She still somehow kept the, kept the house. Okay. Finally got the house modified in like 2016. Okay. And moved to so, say, you know what, you got to move, like just moving, like moving with me. And she did. And uh, we struggled for a minute. We lived in a one bedroom apartment together, which she hates not to everybody, but it's the truth. Um, and then bought the house. How long was that for? Me and her lived together? Yeah. Uh, probably like four solid months. Okay. And so you're out, of, you're out of college. You got this job. You're, you don't walk away from the money. Yeah. People looked at me like I was crazy. You, you're like, <clears throat> it's like you're going backwards. But For sure. you got to take a step back to go farther forward. Every, man, you said it. That was a sound bite. Every time you take steps backwards, yeah. intentionally, 
to go forward, yep. you go forward so much faster than other people that are afraid to be humiliated or be ashamed of how they're going to get it done. Definitely. You know? Uh, yeah, for sure. I understand that part a lot. <laughs> so you do that. You take a step back. Now you're going driving back and forth, trying to figure it out. Got the crib. And now you are ready to become an agent. Yeah. Now I'm like... I'm leaning on a lot of my mentors. I'm getting back into doing informationals again. I'm reading a lot of books. And a friend says to me, and he really like guilt tripped me kind of into it. If you would have been my agent, none of this shit would have happened. And I was like, damn. He's right. I remember I was on the <laughs> phone with you too? You were. That shit was wild. I was like, if you were my agent. Was that me or somebody else said that That too? was somebody else said that too. Because I said that too. Did remember? You, you did. I, I said that same you shit. Did. I was like, bro, if you'd have been my agent, I would have been fine. I would have not had to worry about this. I know I would have got my shot for I my trajectory. I think you got a shot just off yeah. of traits, like yeah. your height, weight, speed, metrics. But people, not all people are like super young when they become agents. Most agents are extremely old. Mm -hmm. So... When they're getting guys that are not top picks, like they thought they were going to come into the business and get top picks because they had such a great personality, but really, realistically, they were losers in high school. Right? They're like, oh, "This is what I thought it was. I don't want to work this hard for no money." Right. Versus looking at it like I'm learning. Mm -hmm. So, I was fortunate enough to learn from from some gentleman named Adam Snyder by a, guy, a lawyer named Adam Snyder, who had a full time law practice and he made okay. a lot of money in that. But he actually gave a shit about the clients he had. And I would argue to him, he treated them too good. Right. He spoiled them and like they weren't that type of quality of player. Right. But he went above and beyond and those players ended up all usually firing him and then they would get cut and they call Adam back and he'd take him back. I wouldn't take him back. Right. Yeah. I, it's like, ah, yeah, bro, yeah. you go, yeah. go trick it off and they want to come back. Yeah, like, I can't help you. Life sucks. I feel that. So, I, yeah, I remember you called me. You was like, bro, I'm an agent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an agent. I need you to hit up. So, 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 so. He did. Tell, tell him put me on. I'm like, all right, bro, we got to put up. We got to get on the line. <laughs> That DM still exists probably. Yeah, somewhere. Man, I remember I was funny. working on a house when you called me because I had just started flipping properties at the time. And then and like you hit me, I came outside. It was like raining a little bit. It's like, yeah, I'm an agent. <laughs> I, I think I got your number from Jordan. I didn't even have his number. Like, that's yeah, like, we, that's had no, we had known each number. other. We had known each other. We had done stuff, but we just didn't have each other's number. <laughs> it's like, yo, what's up? I'm like, well, that's, shit, let's that, do it. That's how crazy I was. I was just called cast it didn't even owe me favors and ask for favors you know <laughs> but i always deliver i always come right, back and ask right. for a favor you know but i mean yeah if you're a good dude and everything too it's easy for people to start you know sharing stuff and for sure. especially when people got good intentions but everybody i think know that's that. a good learning point too a lot of people ask people for stuff mm -hmm. and they just come off like users mm -hmm. you know or they just like don't reciprocate or return the favor mm -hmm. and a lot of people that do that don't make it far, even when they get that favor from like a guy like DJ. They don't return it. Right. It's like, bro, you gotta. It's a give and take. You can't just yeah. take, 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 right. take, like take. Try to give way that. more than you take. Yeah. Just, that's what I always tell everybody. Just and so like that's why. I'm, that's why I made. That's why I wrote this book too, because people hit me up for my time to conduct informationals, but they're not even prepared. Right. So now, and then it comes out. Some people in defense them. Hey, let's get the book first, young college student. Once you make it halfway through, hit me up and let's talk about it so we can go from there. So we have a baseline. So you can kind of know how to conduct informational, not waste my time, yeah. not waste your time, and put a little bit of money in my pocket for the time I'm spending with you. Right. Yeah. And that's another thing, too. Like, I got to applaud you for talking about this shit a year ago. When we, remember last season? We was in the hotel room. Chilling, going to the game. We're like, oh, we're about to meet up. We, we made up. Where uh, where we go? That was a Packers game we went to? We did. I'm like, I'm like, and we stayed at the it? hotel out there somewhere. And <laughs> yeah. we're like going to sleep. And you're like, bro, I'm doing this book. I'm about to drop this shit next year. Da, da, da. Like, And now you did it. Damn. And that's the thing. A lot of people talk about that shit, but then they don't go do it. And it takes time, but you're here and you got it. And I remember I said the same thing. I was like, yeah. When you drop it, we're making a video. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We got to make something happen. That's why he went so hard today. <laughs> That's why I was like, we got to drop the pot. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, because it's dope. I'm excited for stuff like that. It's, it's, people don't do that shit all the time. They just go and talk about it, and then they don't go do it. But there's there's the there's the doers and the non-doers, right? What's that? Uh, uh, what's his name from uh, Shark Tank? Mr. 
Mr. In- uh, Incredible? Mr. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible? Mr. No. Uh, Magnificent? Something no. like that. I don't remember. One of those things. Dude the bald the, dude. Yeah. <laughs> the bald dude. And there's this real, and I honestly, it's some weird shit. I listen to that shit like maybe once a month. And like, I'll listen to it the whole day. I can tell in 90 seconds, winner, loser. And it's so true. You can mm-hmm. tell. Mm-hmm. Like, as you get older, like, who's a winner? Who's a loser? Who's going to make it? Who's not? And very rarely are you wrong. And then people get butt hurt about it yep. because they're the loser, and that's why they get butt hurt. Yeah. But unfortunately, they gotta switch their mindset so then they don't be the loser no more and start changing things up. Well, like we said, but then we're the assholes for saying it. Yeah. <laughs> usually, they just don't have it. Yeah. And the ones that end up figuring it out, they'd be like, "Thank you," mm-hmm. or they'll be like, "They'll still resent you, but they'll talk about you." Yeah. Right. You know, because this cast it misjudged me. You know, some that were hella rude, some that ended up working for me. Mm-hmm. Even when I was at Nike, there were some cats that were extremely disrespectful to me in the information interview process. And I wasn't even, you know, unprepared or unorganized or late tardy or asked dumb questions. And they were just rude. Right. You know, and maybe they were having a bad day. But then that same person ended up, because I was in brand, working in a category um, alongside me mm-hmm. and he was in the same band level as me mm-hmm. but brand leads everybody else follows and executes the brand's game plan mm-hmm. so by default he was beneath me for lack of better terms gotcha. and he had to report what he was doing to me and so I didn't shit on him but he always felt hella awkward that he had to re- report to me or like you know give me his reports right. and it's just it's just crazy how life works so for me it was it's always less than like just never treat people, treat everybody the same because you right. never know who's going to be somebody. Definitely. Up, down, below, side. You just never know. And you still need everybody, whether you they're quote unquote everybody. above or below you or whatever. Like everybody is needed to make something. You, we people, need everybody. I would, I would argue that people that, especially when you're on your way up, the people that are underneath you or following or, you know, not at that band level as you are more important than the people above you. Right. Because the people above you already have their people that they came up with. Mm -hmm. And they're in the roles over you. And they already have a certain type of loyalty and have been through some shit where they already know who's who and they're not looking to add new players to the team. Right. They got their franchise quarterback and the franchise quarterback has his players that he's rocking with. Mm -hmm. Right. You see Aaron Rodgers wasn't going nowhere without Randall Cobb. Right. Right. And that's a real thing in corporate America. You know, so you have to fit, you have to find you, if you're Aaron Rodgers, you got to find your Randall Cobbs, and the Randall Cobbs got to find the Aaron Rodgers, mm-hmm. right? So you're building with the same people, right? Yeah. Yep. Or Aaron Rodgers has to find his Devonte Adams, right? Yeah. That's DJ. <laughs> <laughs> but I ain't throwing him to rock no shit. <laughs> so you're doing this. What about what about the other parts of your business, the other stuff that you got going on with the agency? What do you want to talk about? He wants to talk about the good stuff. He wants to talk about the good stuff. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but I had a quick question. Are you guys interested in taking your shoe game to another level, but you just don't know where to start? I built a full program just for somebody like you, the Six Figure Sneakerhead. This right here, it's an eight week program that takes you through all the steps that you need to know to really know the ins and outs of the shoe game and all the little details in between. Building networks, buying bulk, growing your collection, you name it, there's a lot of details on the inside. Plus, with that, we have a full community where you can engage with everybody else that's going through the same program as you, and we have monthly live meetups where you can connect with me and other members on the inside. We recap how we went with the last month and where we plan to go with the next month, and we set goals for each other and hold each other accountable. Also, with that, we do monthly giveaways. We give away a free pair of shoes every single month with different challenges. And again, there's so much more on the inside. If this is something that's for you or you're looking to take your game to the next level or even flip your sneakers to turn that into real estate, this is the place where you need to be. I can help you with finding loans and remodeling properties and getting yourself on the right path to become a millionaire if that's something that you desire. If this sounds like something for you, hit the link down below in the description and get signed up today. This is more than just sneakers. I wanna see people grow and succeed in all aspects of life. All right, let's get back to the podcast. We're not going to talk about the good stuff because the good stuff is going to slap somebody in the face, right? <laughs> Bow. Never let the never let your right hand know what your left is thinking. But well, we got some know, cool stuff coming. Maybe one day 
we'll do another episode about that topic. Yeah, we will. <laughs> we definitely will. Okay. But I'll keep it surface level. We're dropping some disruptive merch. Click the link right there. That's the name Boom. of his agency. Uh, disruptive, yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to mention that. What the? So do you think, you know, starting the agency and everything too, being a manager now, an agent now, mm-hmm. um, has affected the play on this stuff? Like with the book? Or is it kind of like two different worlds? Like I got my athletes, I got all my stuff. Like are you going to pushing it to them for promo only? Or is it like, are they a key factor to helping you finish writing the book? Or Because no, it's kind of all happening really, at the same really time. Not. I think that the book to me, I see a lot of agents that have books about like the agent process. Mm-hmm. This has nothing to do with being an NFL agent. Mm-hmm. And that's why I wrote it because it's applicable to anybody in the industry. Mm-hmm. You could be, it's really for college graduates, high school students, graduates, you know, MBA gra- graduates and career switchers are people looking to get into a certain career. Okay. So it's teaching you how to conduct informational interviews, go to the person that's done what you want to do and ask him for advice. Don't listen to everybody else that hasn't do what you done mm-hmm. what you want to do. Go to the person that's done what you want to do, that looks the closest to you and ask him how he got to where he was at and ask the right questions and make him or her see themselves in you. So would you say, well, if you were to value informational interviews like what how much would you value your informational interviews and what where it's gotten to you 90 percent of everything i've done 90 percent what what would be a dollar value on something like that a billion maybe a trillion depending on how far we take it (laughs) no i'm serious i mean i think it's probably 90 percent of my current net worth and my future net worth Mm -hmm. because everybody that I'm always conducting informationals, whether people even realize it or not. Mm-hmm. Whether I call it that or not, I'm always asking, like, where are you from? Trying to find common ground, right? Right, right. <clears throat> How did you get to where you were at? That's me asking, where did you come from? What, what was your, what's some overlaps? What's some mutual connections we may have? Right? Mm-hmm. That's just me trying to find common ground and make you feel like I'm a friend. So we're not just talking corporate to each other the whole right. time. Right. That's making you indirectly want to help me <clears throat> mm-hmm. and vice versa. Damn. There's so many ways I can go with asking more about this. I'm trying to think. Uh, I mean, I tell me how information influence have helped you in your life. Like, who was the first person you saw that was a sneakerhead? I don't know if anybody's ever asked you this. The first person I saw was like, a sneakerhead? What, like, what's some inspiration that got you to start becoming like a I think sneaker honestly, icon? I mean, honestly, yeah. The first sneakerheads to me was like my parents. Really? Because they were like mom and dad. My mom and dad both had J's. Like all the OG stuff from back in the nineties, like they was rocking that stuff. And I remember them like matching. (laughs) I remember when the Bread Elevens first came out and they were matching and like the thirteens and all the stuff. Like I remember seeing all that stuff as a kid. So them Mm. keeping them clean, telling me to keep mine clean and everything Mm. like that. And I was I would always ask them like what's coming out next? How do we get it? Where do we go? All the stuff like that. So for me it was truly them. Like it wasn't like a older cousin or something like that. Um, yeah, they were like the root for me. Well, like for me, I think when I first saw you coming up, right, DJ was doing so much. I mean, like flight school was like just popped up out of nowhere and was like it, it felt like it was everywhere. I took over. Yeah. It felt like it was everywhere. And yeah. I was like, what is that? Like, right. you know, like what made you pivot to like, I'm gonna talk about sneakers, I'm gonna go on YouTube, I'm gonna start my own like what what made you start that? Like in current time, like where I started this channel. No, I, I don't. Or I back mean, then, you have so many channels. I, don't I know, even bro. Know. Back then, I did have a channel. Um, originally, I was like, oh, I want to talk about sneakers, but I wanted to like promote the shoes so I could sell them. Mm. So I was like, I could tell people like, hey, go check out my website, shop on my website, but I'm gonna show you the shoe in hand, give you guys an in depth look, and then now you can go buy it and make you love it, teach you about it, and then sell it to you. See, this is how arrogant I am. You guys are probably like really know everything about him. I don't even know this stuff. <laughs> I'm really ignorant. Like, I didn't even know he had a sneaker website store. Yeah, you know I, I mean? used to sell heavy. I used to sell what, a lot eBay? of shoes, bro. No, my own website. See, I was one of the. He top... said it, but I was like, "There's no way he has his <laughs> own website." I was one of the top like ten or fifteen online sneaker resale websites. Like, Complex was writing articles about me. And See, stuff had and... he just kept doing that, he could have figured out StockX. This is why I never liked him. I know. If we could be balling. It's okay. Forget Sundays. We could be balling <laughs> seven days a week. Uh, yeah, it's all good though. <laughs> but I think, I, I don't know. I didn't want to sell shoes forever. Like I wanted to get into real estate and everything. 
We talk about real estate a little bit? Let's talk about it. Okay. So what's the portfolio at now? I have eight units. Okay. And I'm getting ready to add a ninth. Okay. And then I'm getting ready to add another building in the back of the lot. Okay. So I have a garage that I have to redo the soft story. In California, there's a soft story requirement to add densified beams to the building. Oh, okay. So that if the earthquake happens, the building doesn't collapse over the garages. So mm-hmm. I'm going to turn the additional garage, well, actually two of them, but one of the units already done. So I'm going to redo both the unit, one of the units and then add another one to make it a uh, one bedroom, one bath. Okay. So and what do you think the, legal. What do you th- well, after all that stuff is done, what's the value of all your real estate going to be? <sighs> Including my single family home. Probably about three million. Okay, so you got you'll be at three million in real estate, and where are you trying to get to? Because I feel like ten is cool, but like I've never been concerned on the value. Value is so subjective. I know people but, brag about it and like to brag about it. All I care about is the cash flow. I'm not all I yeah, care about. Not, yeah. not set to the back. I don't only care about cash flow because. Otherwise, I'd buy in Texas, in Detroit. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, right, 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 right. Just having a hundred properties, <laughs> but I don't believe in that. I do yeah. believe in you know winning in real estate in four different ways: appreciation, mm-hmm. cash flow. Um, what else? I'm sorry, I'm blanking on my, my tax deductions, mm-hmm. and then just the people. It's not an actual like value, but like the people that you meet, the right. neighborhoods that you're in, the tenants that you have. Mm-hmm. Like, this past year, on this new building I bought because it was nicer, and I redid one of the units, I had a tenant that was interning at a venture capital firm. Mm-hmm. And she was a friend of Brennan's, actually. Wow. Yeah. And she was hella smart. And I didn't even know, but because I was doing informationals, because right. everything goes back together, right. I figured that out. And then she was able to help me learn how to raise capital better and I was able to assist her super last minute <laughs> in a great spot to rent for cheap. Cheaper, raise capital. Not cheap, but cheaper. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. I, and the reason why I said 10 mil I think is cool for just value because I feel like it definitely will put you in a position where it's like you're definitely really comfortable. You could say like I'm done for the most part. It, sh- it should guarantee you a solid cash flow to live a decent life. And there shouldn't be too many words behind something like that. Yeah, I mean, what do I want? What's my number? I want to have, I want to make, I, I'll, I won't stop, but I'll slow down once I have $100,000 a month in rental income mm-hmm. per month. I like that. Right? So that's when I'll slow down. Mm-hmm. I ain't mad at that. Once I can get to that, I'll be cool. Yeah, <clears throat> I feel it. So people are probably wondering how'd you even get into real estate? And how that all started. Shout out to my uncles because they're going to annoy me if I don't. Divine, <laughs> The Divine Brothers. Greg and Eric Divine, they have a YouTube show called Divine Way. Not the not the, any type of way, the right way. The Divine Way. The Divine Way. Please um, go back and look at some of their old content. Not all of it's great, but they're trying. They're real dinosaurs. When I say they, I really mean Eric. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he's so much doper in life than he is on his content most of the time. But he's an he's amazing. Eric really Eric personally really motivated me. Um, he carried on the legacy of my my grandfather just buying real estate. But but Eric made it sexy. He did. Mm-hmm. You know he did. He made it really cool. Even when he was broke, he used to act like he was just balling like crazy. Right. <laughs> he's acting well, like he was balling. We did so that we did an interview. <laughs> I, I went and met with them. For those that don't know, that's on the other on my other channel, DJ Willingham. Because they got like 30 million in real estate or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they got a bunch of doors, a bunch of stuff. There's a lot of information on that video um, as well. But but they taught me the game. They taught you the game. Slowly but surely just... And when I say taught, I think that people misconstrue taught, like teaching someone the game, but like, here's how you do it. Yeah, right. they had a playbook, but you just got to be around people to learn it. And oh, for sure. And ask questions. And then do your own homework behind closed doors. So I started to ask the right questions when I went to graduate school. I intentionally moved back and went to San Francisco so that I could get my master's degree as fast as possible, Mm -hmm. only going to class one to two days a week so I could become an NFL certified agent. And the rest of the time, my free time, when I was doing homework and stuff, I was spending with my uncles Mm -hmm. just watching how they ran their business. Which is like back to the book, right? Exactly. Same thing. Like you said, 90% of all your stuff. It's 90%. The 10 is just DNA. Shut your ass up. (laughs) But I'm serious though. It's not on you. It's in you. <laughs> no, some people real. got it. Some people don't. I was born a king. I was. Yeah. I came from kings. 
I'm a gorilla. I'm an ape. I'm all that. I feel that. I feel that. Well, is there anything you want to go over before we wrap up? Man, I just want to know how big is this podcast going to get? Like, you know, after me, who are you going to have next? Is this show going to go on the road? Oh, we're going to take it on the road for sure. I think it's going to be dope to like, because I travel so much. Mm -hmm. I could take all this stuff with me, set up somewhere. I think I'm only going to have special people over here, um, which you're special. And uh, I think my mom made it. I think it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be dope to hear more stories about people. You know, like like I said, you worked at Nike, different stuff like that. I think hearing those back ends and how they transition to the whole different things, or people that are still in it or in the shoe game or something. I think there's a lot of ways we could tap into stuff and help people see like the entrepreneurship side plus being a sneakerhead because everybody thinks you just waste money on shoes or if you're in the shoe industry, you're just stupid or whatever. But yeah. It's not I, that. It's not that at all. It's never what is perceived to be. And I mean, some of the most brilliant and smartest people I've ever met worked at Nike with me. I mean, from Jerron Smith to Jeremy Smith, his brother, mm -hmm. to Garen Strong, to Chad Easterling, Andy Miguel, Mark Chan. Uh, I mean, just to name a few, Howard White. Yep. Some are still there. Cliff King, Mike Newsom, uh, B Mac, uh, Brandon McLemore. Uh, <laughs> do I say his name? Let me say B Mac. Let me just say B Mac. I don't, I don't actually remember his full name off the top of my head. Um, worked there, worked there. Carol Grant, MVP. I mean, there there are some serious less less green. I mean, there are some serious people that work there that influenced my life, mm -hmm. but showed me as a black man that like you can excel in anything you do. Like, and those are some of the first cats to leave Nike. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it was like the great wave, the great migration. I was like, whoa, he left Nike. Wow. Right. Like Nike's He's, the biggest thing ever. Yeah. It's one of those tops, Apple, all this stuff. Yes, that is true. But you can go do your own thing somewhere else and be bigger. Facts. But being at Nike, I mean, you learn so much. Um, if you can get a job there after undergrad at a young age and just like take it all in and like breathe it and, and not just breathe it, but refine it and not drink too much of the Kool-Aid to where you're blinded. Man, you can. There's so many. There's so many opportunities that come from that. Man, I'm just thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking about all the people that started different things over the years that I've known and met. Make me excited just thinking about like, yeah, Yo, we gotta get people on yeah. the podcast, bro. Bro, and that we're, we're young, right? Like the cast I'm talking about now. I mean, Sharon, he he was the social media manager for Barack Obama, <laughs> and then he went on to go run Steph Curry hey. Inc. And right, you know, I mean, sky's the limit. There's no mm -hmm. ceiling. Mm -hmm. He went from. Nike and everybody's like he left Jerron and people are like oh he where's he about to go work for Under Armour because he didn't get the director role <laughs> and then he just like shitted on everybody <laughs> and he just popped up in a photo with Barack Obama coming off of the fucking uh, the fucking jet and I was like what the fuck he works for Barack Obama and they like this like he's got pictures of hooping versus Barack I'm like yo this, there's no ceiling we can do anything no for real for real. Okay, so hot round, and then we out of here. What is the greatest Air Jordan of all time? The model. You don't have to say colorway. What model is I'm the not, greatest? I'm not a sneakerhead. I'd say, I mean, probably Jordan 11s. Hella futuristic. Yeah. I like the 11s. They Great are, shoe. Yeah. Okay, That's so low top style. If you could only wear one sneaker for the rest of your life, what would it be? Jordan 1s. Low Jordan 1s? Mm -hmm. So just any colors, as long as it's Jordan 1? Any color. Okay. Okay. How many pairs of shoes do you have in your collection now? You know, I sold my whole collection when I went down to buy my house. Okay. Sold everything. I probably had a wall like about like this big, right? Okay. Sold all of them. I just started acquiring more shoes. I think I have like 12. Okay. Like honestly, I don't have more than 12. Okay. I'll, I'll help you get the 13th one then. Yeah, I'll get, that's what I'm talking about. I got man. you, I'm talking about. I got you, bro. All right, cool. Let me get the... Um, <laughs> let me get those like ones from Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah, I want those. <laughs> Not really. Okay. Um, so if you got one thing to say to the people that are watching, uh, you know, if you had a message to yourself or the people that's watching, what would you say? You can do anything you set your mind to and don't let anybody tell you different. 
That's it. All right, buy the book. Tell them where to get it from, where they can follow you at, and we out of here. You can get it anywhere you want, but if you want to help me get the most royalties and not give it to the man, please buy it from Amplify Publishing. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, we'll have the link down below in the description. I appreciate it. Uh, we had a good time. This is the first pot, you know what I'm saying? This is the best Yay! one that we had so far. <laughs>